All right. So, uh, well, I'd like to welcome you to the workshop. And as I was saying, this, our center develops uh, computational programs that are used for simulation and visualization and analysis of biomolecules. And uh, as you all know, so NAMD and BMD are the main programs that are developed here at the center. So these are very recent statistics on, <coughs> uh, on molecular dynamics as a method. As you can see, if you look at the number of papers published using MD as a technique is exponentially rising. So that's really a significant method. Many people are using them. That's probably why you're here to learn about the software. And our goal is really to make uh, this technology, we are a biomedical technology research center. And there are actually places here in the center and also a couple of there, there. So to make the software and technology available to people, so part of it is to develop features, what you guys need, what kind of new simulations you want to do. Uh, part of it is uh, to teach you how to use the software. That's the idea of these workshops. We have several workshops every, every year. In terms of the number of users, a lot of people are using the software. So VMD is the more popular software. That's the visualization program that we have. And the assumption is that you all know how to use VMD. That's uh, because you're going to use VMD a lot during the workshop. More than 100,000 active users. Uh, are using BMD. NAMD is our simulation software, which is used for performing molecular dynamic simulation. We also have a lot of users there, about 20,000 users there. And that's number one program that is used at supercomputer centers, not just to do MD compared to any other program, I don't know, astrophysics, you know, calculating the mass of particles and things of that sort. Most cycles at supercomputer centers are used by NAMD. Uh, because it has had a heavy emphasis on parallelization. It's a, it's a very well parallelized code constantly being optimized for new platforms that become online and available. And that's why people use them. Many people who come to this workshop actually know molecular dynamics as a method, have been using other packages, but realizing that now if you want to go to, I don't know, thousands of processors, it's probably better to use NAMD. They come here just to learn that. So 17,000 NIH-funded researchers are among this. So we are really serving NIH, which is funding this activity. We are an NIH center here. Um, and as in terms of the number of papers citing our package, you can see that there is a there are lots of users using that. And we did some calculation for BMD. So almost every th three hours, one person cites me, which is, which is great. So people are really using this technology. And NIH invests a lot in our center, but we are giving this back to the community. A couple of very important aspects of what we do here. So again, what we are doing here, so we are uh, deploying centers pro uh, packages or programs and BMD to all major computational platforms. This can be your laptop. You can run Lambda on all of these laptops, going all the way to some of the supercomputers that are not even online yet. So we are working with the hardware part to make sure that the program runs perfectly, it's optimized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are constantly adding user requested features for simulation, visualization, and analysis, as sort of uh, motivated and uh, promoted by applications. And a lot of them are experimental. You will see, actually, that we have heavy emphasis in paralleling what is happening on the experimental side in a structural biology. For example, electron microscopy is a very major, uh, is a major area that is growing very fast. And we, there are computational needs to be able to take these densities and convert them to structures. So we are developing software to, to be able to do those things. And I show some examples how. Uh, 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 we do that. We've tried to make the software as easy as possible and as, as accessible as possible. Again, you see examples tomorrow. QuickMD is a prominent example in which uh, you can set up your simulation. We try to streamline and automate or semi-automate all the steps that can be automated in order for experimentalists or novice users to be able to set up the simulations very fast. Interactive features. 
FFTK is another example in which uh, you can actually sort of uh, parameterize the mo molecule without uh, with unknown parameters. That's usually a very tedious step, and we have actually some uh, lectures on that. Uh, simulations in the cloud. Again, Joao, who's sitting here, by the way, I would like to thank him for organizing everything. So you might have seen his emails, but he has been instrumental. <clears throat> and this is the best organized workshop so far, actually, I can tell. So Joao has been also involved in actually developing QuickMD, and he's going to talk about that, and also making it possible once you have set up your simulation using this uh, GUI, then you can just run it on cloud not worrying about setting up a computer, installing the software, and things of that sort. Again, we would like to remove all these barriers to make it really accessible as a method. Oh, I'm, I'm doing experiment. I'm doing NMR in the lab. I'd like to run a quick simulation to see where water goes and how much this side chain is fluctuating. This is the stable, et cetera, et cetera. You can quickly set it up, ship it to Amazon, and of course, you have to pay for that for the computational cycle you get, but then you get the results back and it's going to be maybe a few hundred dollars. So your time is the most expensive part, remember. 90% of my grant money goes to the salary of people. So we try to actually make it really develop advanced technology and also then deploy it and make it available to people. On the hardware side, again, that also takes a lot of effort on the hardware side. So you need to know what's the next GPU that is coming online. You are working directly, actually, with NVIDIA, working on the on the on the, on the technology that will be delivered. I don't know, three, four years down the road. You know, the, the new chips usually take years before they are manufactured. But they are closely working with us to to know how they can optimize their design to make it better for scientific computing. At supercomputers, as I pointed out, always we are working with them before their computers are online to test the NAMD there to make sure it's it's optimized. And, and that takes a lot of effort on the faculty side. Uh, these are Jim Phillips, John Stone. These are NAMD and DMD developers. We have outside collaborators. And Sanjay Kale is one of our faculty members. He's actually a CS faculty who has been with the center for 20 years seven years again, because one of the main emphasis has been optimizing the program uh, for parallel computing. <clears throat> so this is just an overview of what we do in terms of technology. But today is about uh, molecular dynamics as a method. And I decided to, you know, you might have heard a lot about the theory of MD. There are lots of workshops that can get into the technical details and you know, get to the derivations, algorithms, and everything. But that's not the goal of this workshop. So this, this here, we want to see how we are going to use this methodology to understand biological systems. So I decided to call it computational structure of biology, and how to describe biomolecules at nanoscale. And we would like to have this structure that usually comes from experiments. And you will see examples here that use simulation technologies even to build and construct models here. But then we would like to see how they move, because biological systems do what they do when they move. If you freeze something, nothing works, right? So we need, we need to, to describe the dynamics. So I would like you to look at nanoscale phenomena. I think I don't need to convince you guys you're here because you believe in this. This is. These are some examples in biology in which you would like to get into the atomic detail of the problem. Mechanisms in molecular biology, molecular basis of diseases, what happens when you have a single mutation, why this enzyme stops working. Drug design, I mean, this is an example of a tricyclic antidepressant bound to serotonin transporter, uh, or an analog of neurotransmitter transporter. So this drug has been in the market for, I don't know, 30, 35 years. And now we know exactly where it binds, how it interacts with these amino acids, why mutation of these guys might affect the binding affinity, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, you would like to know what happens when this drug took binds to, to this binding site. This is another example of <clears throat> binding of a drug-like molecule, let's say ATP, ADP in this case, binding to Carrier protein, this was uh, what something we published quite a few years ago, but 
this is the first example in which we are seeing ligand binding is spontaneously taking place in atomistic simulation. And of course, when you are talking about ligands drugs, you need to have an atomistic representation because you are interested in the details of these interactions and what happens due to binding, due to you rearrange these residues here and how this might affect protein and what is behind it. That's actually another thing that you get out of these atomistic descriptions. So in this case, for example, because of this very interesting phenomenon, we went in and analyzed the electrostatic potential, and we can explain why we are able to capture this rare event in other proteins that takes microseconds, usually. But in this case, they have been able to capture it in 100 nanoseconds because there is a very strong positive electrostatic potential here, essentially funneling and sucking the ligand into its binding site. And that has some biological ramifications as well. So you get really detailed insight. So you want to describe a phenomenon, but at the same time, you have all the information necessary to make discoveries about protein design and uh, mutations and differences between uh, classes of proteins, etc., etc. Of course, dynamics. This is an example of a transporter system, a molecular machine, if you wish, that is transporting molecules from one side of the membrane to the other one by binding and hydrolyzing ATP in the, in the nucleotide binding. So we, we want to know why it's interesting. Actually, some members of this family work in the import direction. They bring things in. Some members of this family with a pretty similar architecture export things, drugs, for example. It's a drug exporter example. And it's very interesting that the engine part is exactly the same. Now the question is how opening and closing of these domains result in export, coupled export in one case and in import in other cases, etc., etc. So this, uh, this protein is an analog of a P-glycoprotein that causes multi-drug resistance in in cancer cells. So there's a huge medical interest in understanding how it works and whether or not we can uh, inhibit it by drug, by, by other drugs. <clears throat> so you can imagine if you want to do drug design in this case, if I give you a crystal structure, you have only one snapshot to work with. You can do docking, you can search, high throughput screening of databases of millions of compounds to see what might bind to that single state. But if I, if I give you the entire motion of this protein during its transport cycle, you have many, many intermediates to work with. So your chance of finding something specific for this protein would be much higher in that case. So another example, again, I mean, another transporter that works um, using this flip-flop kind of motion. And again, in this case, just to give you that it's not just the motion you get, you have a lot of information. Here's the water contents of the lumen. And you can see how the water content, you just count the number of water molecules during this transition, and you can see that how one end closes and the other end opens during the during the during this simulation. We can describe a lot of details. I have to say that it's non-trivial when you work with these uh, heterogeneous very disordered kind of systems. It's very difficult to make discoveries. Okay, running simulation, I run it 200,000 atoms, I run it for 100 nanoseconds, and now what? Well, what is it that you're gonna look at? And what is it that becomes interesting biology? That's something that I cannot teach you here. We can give you some examples, but that's something that comes with from your experimental collaborations, from reading papers, having some specific questions. That's the part that is non-trivial. So you might be interested in nanotechnology, let's say. So this is another thing that we do here at Illinois. So for that, there is another NSF center that uh, is concentrating mostly on the interface between organic and inorganic material. So here, for example, you're looking at, uh, let's say you have a microfluidic device which is coded by antibodies and you run virus samples to see what sample might have HIV in it and what sample might not. So if you want to improve the design of this device, very nice sensor for biomedical applications, this is usually the picture that people work with, a cartoon. 
a hand-drawn card. How can you use this design to improve the, uh, how can you use this picture to improve the design? So our goal is, and this is a long shot I present, we want to have actually, this is a fully molecular system of the surface, the substrate, it could be any metal or whatever you use, and then you have polyethylene glycol, some of them folded on the surface, some of them stretched, and you have atomistic sort of uh, copies of these antibodies, exactly. And you can, of course, only know what questions you can ask. You can change the densities. You can see how many of them might interact laterally. What would be a good density to prevent this from happening? And you can start asking reasonable questions with a realistic model. So that's the idea. And to construct this, you can see we are going to use molecular dynamics as a technique because you can't just put everything like uh, same copy of the same thing. So you can see the disorder should be uh, introduced realistically. This is another example of a nanoparticle. You might have heard a lot about gold nanoparticles. And again, this is a collaboration with an experimental lab here at UIUC, Kathy Murphy. They do experiment on these guys. And we try to develop realistic models of what they are <coughs> experimenting with. So this is the experimental data they get from the microscope, electron micrograph here. And then these are, in the absence of atomistic simulation and modeling, these are the cartoon models that they have to work with to improve their design. Whereas we believe, actually, we would like to have something that is more realistic, so we can have representations of gold atoms, or you can have one sphere uh, representing the entire core, then you can put sulfur atoms here, these are short peg moieties added to it, and then on top of that now we can simulate it in a box of water if, you're, if there is any interest in what happens. For example, in the hydration of the surface, how deep water molecules go, this is actually a very fast event, a nanosecond process, you can capture it very quickly. Of course, it all depends on the parameters you use for gold. That's a separate issue. But, but then you can actually you can, you can start thinking about how lipids might partition on the surface of this. We are placing a lot of lipids in solution. And then we can have some tricks. In this case, some uh, time-dependent potential changing, encouraging aggregation of lipids to the surface. So yeah, you can come up with a much more realistic representation of what this thing looks like, and now you can go in and ask question, what happens if I change the, any properties of the surface? A couple of applications are um, um, uh, to a structural biology, so you can, you know, these are some examples of a simple lipid simulation. I don't know why it's not, oh, there we go. So you might be interested in the properties of a simple patch of membrane, hydration of the surface, how deep ions go in, what happens if I change sodium by calcium, do they aggregate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You might be interested in the <clears throat> binding of a peptide or a small protein. Antimicrobial peptides, for example, are famous for this effect. To the surface of the membrane, what happens when they bind, how they aggregate. These are kind of processes that can be done using simulations. Or, again, a hydration at the interface of two proteins in a, in a virus shell and how water and ions might exchange from between the inner compartment and outer compartment of a virus. So these are some examples of uh, the kind of processes and phenomena that can be captured in a Here is another nice recent example we had in which we are looking at the membrane protein, the channel, and our experimental colleagues got the channel, and when they looked at the channel, it's completely closed down here. And without the lipids, which are shown in this scary uh, representation, have you seen uh, this famous painting, a scream? It looks like those <laughs> guys. So these are here. So in the absence of lipids, essentially, which you don't see experimentally, you can't explain why this, this thing is an ion channel. So they had this structure. They came to us. And then they put it in a membrane, and then when you simulate it, apply electric field to reproduce a cellular environment, you can see actually that the ion comes out through the side fenestration right in the middle of the membrane, which is something people don't expect usually. The channels usually are considered as a hole going across. So there are lots of interesting things that can be discovered and described using this simulation. So now, <coughs> 
So let's talk about MD itself. Okay, so so uh, this uh, so what we do is uh, to solve the Newtonian equations of motion for all the particles in the system at every time step. That's nothing uh, uh, strange or nothing sort of complicated. Uh, these particles could be atoms. That's for most examples that we talk about this week, we are talking about atomistic simulation, but we can also have much coarser representation of these. You can put together four water molecules to have a coarse grain bead. This week you shouldn't call it atom anymore. So, and then those coarse grain beads can actually move on a much shallower potential energy surface and give you much longer time scales. So this, uh, this movie shows how water molecules go uh, through a water channel. Uh, it, took the, it took me three days in a very cold room to make this movie with EMD, but it made it to the Nobel Prize website. And I usually joke that that's the closest I get to the Nobel Prize. I'm very <laughs> happy. So, so you can actually cut it open and then see inside how water actually forms a single file, sort of typical random walk uh, behavior fluctuating up and down uh, until you have one complete event described. So I'm coloring one of the water molecules yellow. That way you can actually see the net translocation of the single file, which happens in a sort of 200 picosecond segment of a 5 nanosecond trajectory. So this trajectory, nowadays you can do it in a few hours and make this movie in a minute. So it was much, much harder. So now but back to MD. So one of the major limitations, I think you should be aware of this, is one of them is time scale. When you are doing atomistic simulation, you have to take femtosecond uh, time steps, and that sort of limits you to microseconds. Hence, to hundreds of nanoseconds are sort of routine. These are almost expected when you're doing protein systems nowadays. You can actually push it to microsecond easily, a few weeks of simulation, but beyond that, it's very difficult. So if you have a millisecond process, then it's going to be a challenge. You have to do something else. That's a major limitation here that sort of translates or into limited sampling. It's the same thing. And the other approximation or limitation is the approximations that you do in the, in the potential energy function. Force field approximation. Most of these are classical. Uh, uh, force fields that we work with. No polarization, no proton transfer, bonds don't break and fall. So these are major limitations and you are describing a very uh, complicated electronic uh, structure of water, for example, looks simple but it's one of the most complicated, most difficult things to describe. You are de describing this by three points in the space assigning fixed charges to them and you expect to be able to get the diffusion constant, dielectric properties, the structure of water, impossible. So if you want to, depending on what you want to get from this material, then you have to change your force. So these approximations, of course, are all important. So there are, there's a lot of work going into uh, making them more accurate. But there is always a trade-off between accuracy of your potential energy and how much sampling you can do. An extreme example, you can describe everything quantum mechanically and take care of all the electrons, but then your simulation becomes so slow, you can't do even a nanosecond of simulation. So you're getting a better enthalpy or energy description, but then you lose the entropic part because you can't sample the system. So these are the major <coughs> limitations that we need to be aware of. There are lots of tricks that we do in simulation, and I will talk about some examples. Major advantage, of course, is uh, compared to experiment, is you have unparalleled spatial and temporal resolutions as you define such a thing. So uh, you can have sub angstrom resolution uh, and femtosecond temporal resolution. Keep track of every atom every femtosecond. So that's something that cannot be achieved experimentally. Good violate the uncertainty principle. <clears throat> so that's the major advantage, but of course, I mean, it's, I mean, not great would be if you just do some simulations and then couple this to some experiment. So that's really, these are really the most successful kind of application of computation. 
But again, remember, because of this aspect, you can go beyond what can be done experimentally. Don't just try to say, oh, okay, I was able to reproduce experimental data. That's, that's just the beginning. If you can reproduce experimental data, why do they need you? They can do the experiment much better and faster. So you have to use that to benchmark, to calibrate your method, but then you go beyond that to explain more. That's the idea. So in terms of sort of setting up a typical MD simulation, there are a few steps involved. You know, and I think we, again, many of you might have done simulations for other systems, materials. When, when it comes to biological systems, they have their own rules and their own behaviors and their own nomenclature. <clears throat> Proteins, secondary structures, amino acids, backbone, side chain. So there is a, there is some work and some some things that need to be learned there. So you prepare the molecule. Usually that means reading something called PDB, protein data bank structure, and PSF, protein structure file that you have to generate. So, and then you do some minimization to sort of bring down, cool down the system a little bit and do initial heating, be immediately taking it to the room temperature or body temperature, wherever you want to simulate the system or you can do it stepwise. Then we do equilibration make sure that the system has equilibrated. I have to put this in quotation because it depends on what you mean by equilibration. If you're looking at RMSD or you're expecting other kinds of equilibration, this could be a very difficult uh, thing to define. And then after that, we do dynamics, as these are your production runs. You run the system under particular conditions, constant number, constant volume, constant energy, or constant pressure and temperature depending on what you want to do, what ensemble, thermodynamic ensemble you want to use, and then collect your data and analyze. In here, you evaluate some observables, uh, see how they might relate from it. So you have a microscopic description of the system, and you can see how average properties might relate to macroscopic measurements that people usually do experimentally. For a long time, uh, uh, we had to do this sort of uh, averaging and compare to macroscopic ensemble properties, but again, over the last 10 years or so, there are also single molecule experiments uh, that can actually be behave very similar to your simulations. So you can maybe even compare to those and have a <coughs> better comparison. So again, uh, one, in terms of preparing all these steps, how to set them up, how to read them, how to clean them up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. QuickMD is one of the plugins that uh, Joao and um, his colleagues have put together that allows you to go through all these tedious steps much more easily. So you still need to know what you are doing, what you want to do, but then all the steps are streamlined. Um, tomorrow you will talk about this, and I heavily, I highly recommend that you can you give it a try. You can also use it to analyze your trajectory. You see, in this case, you're looking at different properties of the molecular system and how they change as the simulation is running. Or, uh, so this is a very useful tool to, to, to try. So now, structural biology. On the experimental side, there is a lot of effort to go from cell scale processes. People are tired of looking at uh, single molecules outside the cellular context. Because if you think about it, biology is all about complexity. If you just could look at a single protein outside the cell, it might behave differently. But when you put it back into the cell in the presence of 100 other proteins coming in, regulations, lots of uh, pathways inside the cell, the same protein can behave very differently. It's like you isolated on an island might be a different person when you compared to when you are in your classroom or in a city interacting with other people. So this is really what biology is going. We would like to understand how things work within the cellular environment or the whole organism, hopefully one day. And then on the structural biology, on the experimental side, that's actually the trend. Uh, so people would like to look at proteins or cellular structures. And uh, these are some of the methods especially electron microscopy, single molecule, uh, uh, single particle electron microscopy has become very popular. They have very nice detectors and cameras allowing them to take a lot of pictures. 
And that has become a major structural biology uh, experimental method. So we try to develop also a computational methods. And as you will see, in many of these steps, we're going to use MD as a refinement technique. So for example, uh, yeah, so this is, we have this tool called molecular dynamics flexible fitting. So usually what you do, you get your electron microscopy map. It's usually low resolution. It doesn't allow you to resolve atomic detail of a protein. But then you might have atomic detail of the protein in a different state, maybe in a different conformation, but from X-ray crystallography you have it, or you might have put together a model somewhere else, and you would like to fit this into this density. So usually what experimentalists do is to grab these pieces and just by hand, or using another program, rigid fitting of these elements into the density. Whereas what we are suggesting, or what the idea of this method is that, so let's run any simulation on those red dyes coming from here. And while they are moving, while they are following the potential energy function that we define for them, while they are maintaining their chemical structure and having the possibility of relaxing if there are clashes and everything, then you can also bring them into the density by additional potentials that we define. So we define a gravitational field generated by this potential, so they, they become attractive, and then you run the simulation in the presence of that attractive potential, and that's the best way of nicely fitting them into the density. <clears throat> so that's one example in which you use MD to generate the structures or fittings that are used in experimental work. So another thing that I pointed out, and is that you would like to put, let's say, cell scale uh, models. And that's a sort of new uh, kind of uh, theme in the center, because again, we recognize that's the future. That's where people are going. That's where we would like to be five years down the road. So we are developing tools also to be able to put together sort of very organelle level or cell level complex systems. And these are extremely complex in terms of setup. And we use MD as, a, again, refinement technique, as a modeling tool, not just going after ensemble properties and thermodynamic properties of a system, but just to be able to put things together, let's say, out of thousands of proteins and tens of thousands of lipids together in a nice arrangement cannot be done without nice relaxation and nice packing. So here is again some example of how we put these things together just for you to have fun. We start with a membrane. It could be spherical. We use some Fibonacci algorithm to distribute the lipids. And then uh, we have actually scripts to pack them with the right type of lipids in the, in the, in the two leaflets. Then we, by sort of super coarse graining proteins that are supposed to go into the membrane, you can see, we can nicely see what is the membrane part, what is outside the membrane, what is inside the membrane by a clustering, clustering algorithm that Eric developed. I think I saw Eric. I mean, but. So, and now then you can take these objects and make several of them you can place in, uh, in space, no solvent, nothing, but define the membrane region as a potential and do MD as a technique allowing them to randomly distribute based on their geometry, shape, size, nicely distribute. And again, this is not five or six or 10. You are talking about thousands of proteins. You cannot do this by hand. You are trying to automate these things. And then once you have the initial distribution, then you can place your protein, generate densities based on these proteins, and use those densities to push out the lipids and completely carve a uh, a space that fits exactly the structure of this protein, for example. If you are interested, I can actually talk to you individually, but I'm just giving you examples in which we are using MD as part of a modeling, structure building kind of process. So this is an example. You see 1,400 different types of proteins and shapes, it's shape, different shapes and sizes. The whole thing is 0.4 micron long, and if you go to atomistic system, fill it with water, it would be a billion atoms, which 
has its own challenges for NAMD because now you need to have larger arrays in compilation of NAMD or things like that. So this is another example in which we started an experimental density of ER endoplasmic reticulum, and we would like to generate the atomistic model of this, for example. So this is what you're looking at as is actually an atomistic model of ER. <coughs> So different lipid compositions here, Let's call it experimentally derived membrane of arbitrary shape builder or X mass builder. Uh, the electron density comes from a cell paper 2013. Lipid composition comes from another paper, and you can see these are all individual lipids colored based on this key here. You can see the inner leaflet, outer leaflet, cholesterol, it's a black guys over there. So again, we put this together after more than a year of effort just using uh, sort of methodology that includes MD a lot. So here is just to give you an example how we do these things and start with the density uh, and then uh, remesh it and then so that allows you to have fine enough mesh to be able to define the plane and the normal to the plane for the outer leaflet, inner leaflet, and then the, those normals allow you to place the lipids. Uh, but then when you place these lipids, then they start having clashes with each other. They go into each other. You might have ring piercing. You need to somehow distribute with them initially. What you do, you start with coarse grain representation and do a little MD, you can see to allow them to nicely here. Distribute on the surface that you are interested in and then take these and convert them to uh, full lipids based on the normal calculation that was done earlier. <clears throat> here is the membrane normal. So you, then you place a lipid taken from a library of random conformations. They're going to go into each other. You might have clashing issues, and again, you use MD, it's ring piercing, for example, in which you have a bond going through the rings of cholesterol, for example. This doesn't get resolved during the simulation. We have to do additional work here. So we do, we use MD a lot uh, for model building of very large structural systems. So, okay, so again, so now let's back up. So I gave you some examples of uh, why, how we use MD, so let's back up to the sort of method level again. So you want to generate a thermodynamic ensemble using MD, molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo simulations are two methods that can generate an ensemble, a thermodynamic ensemble for you if you're primarily interested in that. So that gives you some statistics about the behavior of the system. You are taking into account fluctuation and dynamics in interpretation of experimental observables. You are interested in a bond distance. You take it from the PDB. That's just one frame. Whereas if you simulate it in the presence of water and everything, you get a nice distribution of bond, angle, hydration, potential electricity, potential whatever you're interested in, taking into account fluctuation and diffusion. You can describe molecular processes. I showed you a couple of examples. We'll look at more. And you can also calculate free energy, and that's Usually the most expensive part of this business because you need to uh, um, calculate entropy, which means you have to have nice sampling. And then as I pointed out, you can help with molecular modeling. Basics of MD, pretty simple. MD 101, you know the position and velocities of a molecular system at a given time. The position usually comes from a PDB for proteins or you model them together uh, using homology modeling or any modeling tool that you have. Velocities we initially assign using Boltzmann distribution to uh, fit to a particular Maxwell Boltzmann distribution to fit to a particular temperature that you want to simulate. You randomly assign this. If you know this, then you can calculate the position at a later time. Your velocity changes based on acceleration. You know velocity and acceleration, and you can calculate how velocity changes. And acceleration is related to the force acting on those individual atoms. 
So force is a little bit difficult to work with at the level of derivation. So we usually work with an potential energy function, the derivative of which is the force. That's it. So the only thing we need to do is this. That's your force field. How would you define potential energy? How would you describe the interaction between these atoms, repulsions, attractions, bonds, angles? How many different forms of potential energy function do you have to have in your potential energy form two? So then you say, let's say you have a, this is your potential energy. And again, so this is this is the potential energy that you define. This is not God's or nature's potential energy. This is how, what you define based on the number of terms that you put in that potential energy function. So you start with a PDP, a protein that comes from experiment. That has been feeling a different potential energy landscape. Now you place that set of coordinates on your potential energy. So that usually results in a high energy state. It's not relaxed, it's not at the bottom of one of these wells. So that's why we usually start with some minimization before you start with MD to bring it down to here, brings it to the closest potential energy well. And now at this point, you have removed all the bad contacts, all the high energy or hot spots in your molecular system. Now here you can actually start to thermalize the system, give it temperature, kinetic energy to allow it to get out of this local minimum energy point and then maybe start exploring the landscape. Finding a global energy, minimum energy position is one of the people are usually very much interested in this guy. You might be here, you want actually to sample enough to find this global energy, but to, 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 to even better is to sample the entire energy landscape then you can have actually really all the properties. What you're measuring experimentally, depending on the time scale, is the average of these, Boltzmann average uh, observables here. So if you can describe transition between these and nicely going back and forth, then you have an equilibrium system, okay? And of course, all of these could be much more rugged here, depending on coarseness or fineness of the potential energy that you have. So it's a very difficult thing to define what is equilibrium, what is equilibrium. It depends on what you want to look at. So usually when you go back and forth between the two states many, many times, then you have an equilibrium, equilibrated system and you can talk about the free energy difference between the two and things of that. So really describing this potential energy surface and visiting different points, describing these barriers and these uh, microstates is the goal, it could be one of the goals that you have in, in energy. So now potential energy, so again, you see, if, you, if I define this potential energy, then the rest is easy. I get the force, acceleration, velocities, positions, how they change, etc., etc. So we have two types of uh, interaction energies in in the type of simulations that you do today. One is non-bonded interactions. If your system is not charged, you're only dealing with the uh, with, uh, Van der Waals interactions, which are described by this Leonard Jones potential. You know, maybe we'll talk about this more on Thursday in the UK. So we have uh, terms, we have the distance between any two atoms in the system, any two particles. And uh, that's the actual distance between them. And then we have a parameter, which is the optimal distance between those, those two at which you have minimum energy. The repulsive part, an attractive part, the negative sign here. So at very short distances, it becomes very repulsive. At longer distances, it's always attractive. So any pairs of particles are attracting each other at this kind of strength. That's the uh, depth of the potential energy well. So any pairs are interacting with each other and attracting each other at long distances. And if you have charge in the system, then we use Coulomb equation to describe the charge-charge interaction. So these are the two types of 
non-bounded interaction. Very easy, you can write your own code. Few lines, okay, I have Q, I, Q, J, and I have R mean for I, minimum radius for I, minimum radius for J, define, done. It's very simple to do. And the derivative of this would be the force, and you're done. What makes it a little bit complicated, the biomolecules and molecular system, is that usually now you have bonds now. So now the interaction between these two guys, if, are not, if they are not bonded to each other, if you are simulating argon gas or a box of argon, easy, very easy. But the, the fact that they are not bonded to each other, this interaction is a different kind of interaction. We cannot describe it as a two uh, van der Waals. Particles. So now there is a bond here, so there we know from a spectroscopy, we know from experiment that these two atoms can now come very close to each other, 1.5 angstrom, two carbon atoms. Uh, and now we have to have a new way of describing this interaction. And again, the question is how many types of internal coordinates or, or potential energy terms should I use to describe the molecular behavior? So we know bonds, we have nice uh, infrared spectroscopy, information on the nature of bonds and their vibration events, so you can use that information to describe these individual bonds as springs. We know their force constant because we know the frequency of their vibration in a molecular system, and we can define things very nicely. So, but bonds are not enough, we also we need more. Then we go after angles, say, okay, we're going to for each three atoms that are connected to each other, I'm going to define an angle, and how am I going to describe it? Let's describe that one also as a harmonic potential spring for, in which, for which I need a equilibrium uh, value, at which point I have minimum energy and I need a force constant. So, and now you see I have to now define all the bonds, for each bond, depending on what atoms are forming that bond, is it a single bond, double bond, is it NCC or is it CCC? I have to define all these topology information, atom types, force constants, equilibrium values. Again, that's not enough. If you just include that and run your molecular system, you see that it's not behaving naturally. If you compare it to experiment, you don't see all the vibrations. Now you have to go in and do dihedrals, dihedral angles as well. So now for each four atoms <coughs> connected to each other, now I have to define a potential. So in this case, I'm not going to use a harmonic potential because the harmonic potential doesn't allow the bond to rotate, and I know that these bonds rotate. So right. So instead of having a harmonic potential that doesn't allow my bond for, to, to rotate, now I this time I'm going to use <coughs> a periodic function, a sine function, a cosine function to allow this, this bond to rotate because I know they are supposed to. And now again, you can see for this potential, I need to know four atoms connected, which atoms are connected to each other, what are the atom types, what is the height of the barrier separating the minimum? What is the periodicity of this? Is it three, like a metal group, three sort of identical configurations are forming as you rotate it? Is it two, is it one, sometimes combination, etc. So these, this is what we spend almost a day on this because that's a tedious part and you need to understand it. If you these things have been defined for standard uh, protein fragments like residues, uh, lipids, DNA bases, and some basic molecular, molecular system, but you might have your own drug. If you have your own drug and your own whole project is about how this drug affects the protein, then you have to do this parameterization for, the, for this new molecule. And if you can't do it, oftentimes say, okay, forget about the project, let's move on and do something else. So that's an important step, tedious, not much science into it, but uh, you have to do it as carefully as you can, and uh, that's something important that we, we will talk about. So the combination of all these potentials, the constants, and everything becomes your force field. This is actually the field in which these atoms are moving and feel the force back and right, left and right, uh, back and forth, left and right, and then under those fields they are moving. So it's very important to 
describe this as accurately as we can. So by the way, if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt. That gives me a break also. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an example of an energy function uh, for biomolecular uh, simulations. Most uh, widely used by molecular uh, simulation engines use similar potentials. Uh, let me start from the end. You have the uh, Lennard Jones for your Van der Waals interactions, and you have the Coulomb charge charge interactions down here. And these are the three elements of bonded interactions. For all the bonds, I need to have an equilibrium value and a torsion scan. For all the angles, the same. I will provide the PDF for all of this. You don't have to. But if you like, you can. But so, and then for all the dihedral angles, I have a periodic system or, or term. Yeah. This is one example. Sometimes you have something called improper dihedral angles because people have started with dihedral angles and they realize that there is a planar center that move, gets out of plane too much. It seems that dihedral angles alone are not enough to describe or to maintain the planarity of that center. We know that from experiment. So then in order to keep it planar, they added improper dihedral angles, and they talk about this on Thursday. Or to keep it as a pyramid, you can actually enforce uh, an additional improper on that center. So these are bonds, angles, dihedral angles, four atoms in a row, and improper dihedral angles. Dihedral means two planes. So this could be actually the plane between these three and those three, <coughs> or it could be two planes defined by <coughs> a center atom connected to three other atoms. Okay, so um, yeah, so then, um, yes, we want to do molecular dynamics. We have the potential energy uh, here going into our acceleration at a temperature that you give to the system. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, I was just curious. You said that if you were only looking at, for example, the energy term from like the first constant of the bond and of you know, consider the angle of three atoms, it wasn't sufficient to even see all of the vibration and later to really get it compared to the biological system. Um, then, so you included the improper and proper dihedral angles, and it included the proper. I was just wondering what exactly are you looking at and quantifying when you're comparing it to the biological system? Or to I see. That are right? Sure. A very good question. So I, I guess for that part, for calibrating these potentials, we don't use biological system. We don't go to the whole protein and see what happens. If you, we usually use model compounds. <clears throat> That's something actually that for any force field, uh, you use a very small compounds that have the essence of your molecular system. So like you want to simulate the protein, instead of simulating the entire protein, I'm going to can you see from there? This one? Okay. So I'm going to use something, something like this. This is a peptide bond. And I'm going to put two methyl groups here. Because probably there are lots of detailed experiments on this molecule, molecular system. I can go and look at heat of vaporization. I can look at the entire IR spectroscopy of this and everything. And then fit my parameters to this model compound. <coughs> And if I get it right here, then I'm hoping when it goes to the protein, everything at that level is fine, and I can start looking at more interesting biological properties of the protein. So usually that's what you're doing. So here in this example, for example, you have this center that is sp2. So it should be planar. Also this nitrogen, because of the partial double bond nature, has to have some sp2 nature. So these are the two centers that should be more or less planar. We know that from the spectroscopy, experimental spectroscopy performance. If you don't include those improper angles, then you see too much out of plane movement at these centers. You're controlling this dihedral angle, this one, this one, this one, but that's not good enough to keep that center planar. So that's why now we come in and define another potential here to keep it planar. <coughs> Sense? Yeah, I did have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so you have a cutoff at four atoms. Do you consider five atoms, or is it just not statistically significant an improvement, or is that too computationally expensive? So okay. So I guess I mean I don't know what 
what is it that I should define uh, for five atoms? So usually, I think from spect vibrational spectroscopy, uh, <coughs> how to say it? Yes, I mean, there, is, there are no vibrations that you can assign to five atoms easily. You, in the X, Y, Z coordinate, yes. But in the, in the inter internal coordinate space, which is bonds, angles, or hydrons, if you convert all the x, y, z vibrations that you have, 3 and minus 6, for a, you get 3 and minus 6 is a rotational and translational degrees of freedom. <clears throat> you get 3 and minus 6 vibrations from a spectroscopy. So, and then this can be mapped nicely to bonds, angles, dihedral angles. So for more than that, five, six, seven, um, there are no natural internal coordinates considered. So that's OK, so here, yes, I mean, you have, you define your potential for, which is a uh, function of the coordinates or the positions of the atoms that you have. And then <clears throat> your force will be the uh, mass times acceleration, second derivative of uh, position with respect to time, and that would be your force. And then you just do this again and again and again and again every time you step of the simulation, you get the force and see how the velocities of individual atoms are affected, how far they move, etc., etc. Uh, I pointed out you get the coordinate from crystal structure, velocities we do it based on Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, matching the temperature we want to simulate. And in reality, most, most of the time, you can do this with different kinds of calculation, but we do Langevin dynamics in which uh, the acceler your acceleration is not just a force coming from the force field. We also have a sort of a friction term here and a noise that sort of balance each other at the, at the temperature that you want to simulate. So there are additional uh, values that you put in your configuration file. You specify this gamma, for example, that introduces some friction in the system. OK. So I already talked about time step. That's a uh, time scale limitation and the bottleneck. That's the most serious bottlenecks we have. So if you look at uh, molecular processes or phenomena, so uh, the time step of MD simulation or atomistic MD simulation is one femtosecond, so one femtosecond. Bond stretching, is are very fast, the order of 10, 15 femtosecond period. So you can describe this very well, no problem. You can rotation of surface side chains, elastic vibrations on a picosecond to nanosecond time scale. Can do it very easily. Hinge bending, then you can go to uh, uh, to a nanosecond time scale. So this these are the this is the time it takes to run uh, this kind of simulation. But I have to, I think these are uh, very old numbers. So you can run easily microsecond. It doesn't take a year to run a microsecond simulation. But actually, you can see a lot of interesting stuff is happening in a millisecond to a second time scale. So that's, again, uh, Martin Karplus was here last week. So he got the Nobel Prize for molecular dynamics and multi-scale simulation. And he did the first simulation of a protein. But if you go, go back, that was a few picosecond. I don't know. Do you know what exactly it was? But it was on the picosecond time scale, in which just, just a protein just move. And, uh, uh, sorry? Trips an inhibitor from Martin? I think BPTI it was. But it's a small protein. But the point was, if you pick a second, just, you just see that the protein is vibrating and wiggling in its position. Nothing happens to it. And it was interesting. I quote my colleague, uh, Klaus Schulten, who unfortunately passed away last year. So he would always say that the first time crystallographer, X ray crystallographers see or saw MD simulation results, they were surprised because, I mean, I mean no, the molecules don't move. <laughs> you see them in the crystal, it's, it's a crystal, you know? It was a very strange concept for many experimentalists, apparently. I, I was shocked. I mean, now everybody, of course, molecules. Even my son knows molecules move because he sees animation on my computer every time. He's a fifth grader. 
So, but back then, apparently, just seeing that things are moving was not quite a sort of very popular uh, concept. So back then, it was a few picoseconds, but again, now that we can run more and more simulation, longer and longer simulation, now we expect to describe more interesting phenomena. Nanosecond processes, you can actually nicely see hydration of cavities, where water goes, side chain vibrations, and things of that sort. But if you want to look at large-scale conformation or changes of a transporter in the membrane, then you have to take it to longer time. So. What's the reason we began using DTS? Oh, okay, I see. And I have one more question too. Yes, because uh, if you have a Thomistic system, very good question. So if you have a Thomistic system, the, these things, these bonds, bonds are the fastest degrees of freedom. The vibration is on the 10, especially the hydrogen, the bonds that involve hydrogen, because hydrogen has a small mass, your frequency is very high. So now you imagine that you have a bond that is going back and forth every 10 femtosecond. So in order to describe its uh, motion naturally, you have to have take at least 10 pictures for this periodic motion, right? So let's say if you take one, one picture every 10 femtosecond, you see it always the same time. 10 femtosecond, you take a picture here, goes here, comes back in 10 femtosecond, you take a picture in at that moment, you see it always the same place. You don't see this motion. If you take half a, every five picosecond, you might capture it the same place here. So if this, if this is the periodic motion, you might every 10 femtosecond, you'll be here. Every five femtosecond, you'll be here. So you want to take enough snapshots to describe this periodic. So that's the one reason. So in order to describe this frequency, this vibration, you have to take about 10 snapshots. Otherwise, you don't have a correct description. On the technical side, so now what is happening is, uh, go back to, to this simple here. So you calculate the force based on that divided by mass, you get the acceleration. And then you time, you, you move, Using that acceleration, I'm feeling a large force coming from the left, and I move. How far would you move before you recalculate the forces? If this delta T is too large, so instead of one femtosecond, I move, let's say, 10 femtoseconds. So let's say this bond wants to stretch at that moment. You move that for 10 femtoseconds. I go too far, way too far. The bond is way too long. Maybe I start clashing into other atoms because you're just letting me move under that acceleration for too long, unnaturally. <coughs> that uh, is calculated for that moment. I should make it as small as possible, otherwise it's inaccurate. So you move too much, and now you start clashing into other atoms, and next time you feel a huge force pushing you back. And now another 10 femtosecond, now I'm going to go that way too much. So your simulation starts to diverge, and it crashes. That's there is also a technical reason for that. So that's why we are limited for that. So now there are ways. If you don't describe this atomistically, the system atomistically, then you don't have to worry about this. There are these hydrogens I have. These hydrogens are the fastest moving. Sometimes there are force fields in which you get rid of this hydrogen. You include them in the heavy atom. Then you can go to three, four femtoseconds, obviously. You go to coarse grain descriptions in which, let's say, this whole thing becomes not this, this whole side chain. Yeah, this whole backbone becomes one residue, one, one bead. The whole side chain becomes one bead, then you can go to 20 femtosecond time steps. And uh, at the same time, you have a much shallower, the number of particles becomes smaller as well. Then you become actually, it becomes uh, easier to run several microseconds or the milliseconds. But then you lose the atomistic detail. You lose your hydrogen bonds. I have a... Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you actually do a friction term. But that is... So the friction is more like a boost. Uh, and it's quantity. Not, uh, so a boost? Does, boost? Uh, like a boost. So it's not like a, an, an atomic property. 
So do you do you include a prediction then for every atom? Yeah, so you can exclude, again, I mean, you can exclude uh, some atoms from being affected. It usually has a damping effect on your property because you, mean, you have these random uh, hits coming from the, but it's supposed to uh, uh, reproduce the effect of environment sort of realistically. Yeah, sure. It, it has a damping effect. In fact, if your gamma is too much, then your I mean, we have already a time scale issue. We don't see things happening. Now you're going to damp them with, uh, <clears throat> with gamma, so things are going to become slower. Uh, so we try not to use very large gammas. And it's a little hard. We had a long discussion what would be the best gamma to use, because we use it sometimes to control the temperature as well. Um, so we try to have 0.5 or 1 in damping units. Sometimes you can use gamma to create uh, friction. For example, let's say if you have implicit solvent simulation. So implicit solvent, you get rid of the solvent. That reduces the number of uh, solvent atoms you have. But then uh, probably the more important effect is that you don't have the friction of the solvent. Now the protein can move freely in vacuum because there is nothing in the way. So in order to put back some of the friction, now we can go by the use gamma of 20. So then somehow, depending on what you want to do, you can use it to somehow tune the viscosity of the, of the system. So let me actually quickly get to this point, and then we can have a break in uh, 10, 15 minutes. Now, I have 23 minutes. So let me, OK, so your goal is you start from here. You minimize the system. It comes here. And then you heat it. comes here. and then. Maybe depending on how much heat you give to it. And this barrier here, you can overcome this barrier, maybe the second barrier, and then you end up with this minimum energy basin. And the energy that you give to the system is Kt, that's your temperature, that's the <coughs> Boltzmann constant here, Kt. You have Kt energy, and of course, uh, it's not like every particle, every degree of freedom has always KT. You are talking about an average distribution. So depending on the distribution of this, some of these guys might be higher energy, some of them might be lower. But on the average, you can nicely sample this part of the potential. So now if you want to if you want to go beyond the next barrier, it seems to be higher than KT, the available energy on the average, then you have to wait. You have to wait for some particles to happen to have much higher energy than Kt to be able to overcome this barrier to go to the next. So the higher this barrier, the more you have to wait for some of these particles. And again, this is a one-dimensional system. You can imagine this could be a conformation or the position of a single particle. It doesn't matter. So you have to wait to allow this thermal energy, random collisions of particles to create enough kinetic energy for you to be able to overcome this barrier. And as I pointed out, your goal is to nicely sample this whole energy landscape. In this example, we have four major basins. And depends on what you want to do. If your experiment, let's say I have NMR experiment I don't know. They are looking at nanosecond properties of a single molecule. I don't think. Let's say something else. A FRET experiment that you can do on a single one. You have a FRET experiment and you are looking at the distance of something and you have a very high temporal resolution. So maybe this is enough for me, right? If you are looking at a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, NMR experiment in which I will have an average behavior. So ensemble average of all these microstates, then in order to reproduce that ensemble behavior, I should sample here my bond is one angstrom, here my distance is two angstrom, here's three, here's four. If I don't sample those three basins, I say my average distance is one, experimentally the colleague says, oh no, it's two and a half. So in order to reproduce experimental loops, so you have to sample all these basins. So it really depends on what you want to do. So now, and then what is equilibrated system? Again, if you are looking at the property here in this basin, as long as you have spent enough time here, 
can consider the systemic reading. If you are looking at something else that requires all these microstates to be sampled, then you have to run it much, much longer to see transition. Goes here, comes back, goes here, goes here, comes back, comes back. So you have to sample all of these to consider your system equilibrium. Depends on what you want to do. But the goal is again, sort of use thermal energy and then the most natural interaction profile force field that we can to be able to sample the behavior of the system, in this case, conformation, distance, hydration, charge, ion position, whatever it, uh, you want to describe. So here is one example. For example, I think if, uh, if you look at the simple dihedral angle, in this case, this dihedral angle that you are looking at specified by these four atoms, and you can monitor that in your simulation very nicely using VMD. You, as I pointed out, you have the trajectory, you can look at whatever you want. And it's a very short simulation, a one nanosecond simulation. And you look at the dihedral angle, you plot that, you can see it might look equilibrated here because the dihedral angle is not changing. But then at 850 or 900 picosecond, oh, suddenly it flips. You start flipping the, seeing the flipping of this ring. Yeah? So now, now, okay, so I thought the system was equilibrated, stable, but now that I've worked longer, I realize, oh no, it has two states. Goes from here to there. I don't have enough sampling to know whether it's coming back or not. But there is another state present. So now if you want, if you're really interested in that part of the protein, you have to run this long enough to see if it goes back and forth. Maybe the protein data bank structure was wrong Maybe it was a crystal contact that forced this guy to be in there. And if you run this simulation for another 100 nanoseconds, it just stays there. That's possible. Maybe your force field is wrong, and that's why you snap into that state and stay there. That's also possible. But ideally, as an example, it would be nice to see how it goes there, spend some time there, comes back, spend some time here, goes back. And if you have this back and forth situation, sampling both the states, then you can see how, what fraction of time the state in this microstate or in this conformation, what fraction of time the state in that conformation, and based on the probability, you can even say what the free energy difference between these two states is. Yeah. So that's an equilibrated system, nicely allowing you to say, okay, based on my simulation, having 50 transition back and forth, or 10 transition, I can say this state is 70% of the time populated, that one is 30%, and you just get the free energy difference between the two states very Yes? Where do you set the threshold? Like the fluctuations you see can also be like one state. Where Absolutely. This is, you have to define the state. Maybe for you, this is one state, this is one, absolutely. In that case, you have nice equilibrium here between these microstates, and you can nice talk about their free energy, sure. That's a, that's, a, that's a general problem. Reaction coordinate and the state, this is something you have to define. Am I interested in every little movement of a hydrogen, or no? Just put them together as the, uh, the position of the ion along the channel is more interesting, or should I also look at everything else? You have to define along what reaction coordinate you want to define your states, absolutely. All those basins we talked about, they can have a lot of, here you can have a lot of this kind. Am I going to define these also as the states? It's up to you. You define the problem. Exactly. You had a question. Yeah, I was going to ask, theoretically, if the frequency of those transitions are sensitive to your simulation temperature, right? So how far, if it's going to even flip up to that other state, is you have to be sampling at a, an appropriate temperature, correct? So how yeah, so know? we try to match this to expect. Yeah, sure. I mean, but again, usually we do room temperature or body temperature. I mean, body temperature is a few degrees higher. You get a 3% higher kinetic energy that might help. Right. So that's what we do. But uh, I, I don't think, and for most biological systems, you're right, absolutely sure. 
But for most biological systems, uh, I think uh, uh, we are not concerned about how temperature changes the frequency. We try to match the experiments. Or if you don't have any experiment, you do it at room temperature or body temperature. But you're right, yeah, sure. OK, so I talked about this one. Let me skip this. This is a memory protein. I talked about here. So I, I mentioned that the initial coordinates are coming from either modeling or protein data bank, or previous simulation, or velocities. What we do, so we use Maxwell. Boltzmann distribution here for uh, to <clears throat> target a particular temperature that we want to simulate, um, and then we use that uh, the kinetic energy also as a thermostat to find out what the temperature of the system. So initially, what you do, you assign randomly a bunch of velocities to all the atoms in the molecular system that reproduces your temperature, and then they're gonna transfer kinetic energy between them and uh, and equilibrate. So this is done by also algorithmically in the program. So I talked about that the hydral angle another thing that we usually measure when you're looking at the pro at the, at the protein simulation and I think you have an example in your tutorial today is RMSD. So this is a very global collective variable looking at the entire protein. If you look at all the atoms, usually C alpha atoms, which is the backbone, or all the back heavy atoms in the backbone, or all the heavy atoms in your system, you define uh, what atoms should be included in this RFP based on what you want. And you look at them, how much they move from their initial position, square that, get the average of that, and that gives you root mean square deviation of the system over a period of time that you simulate. You can have time series for that. This is, let's say, for this example, you're running an MD simulation of 1,000 uh, picosecond or 1,000 uh, picosecond, it should be. And you can see that the RMSD stabilizes at about 1.5 nanoseconds. So I think it's reasonable to say that this here, the RMSD is not changing. You never know what happens if you run 10 nanoseconds or it might jump up, it might click into a different conformation. That's impossible to predict. But at least within this time scale that you're simulating, it seems that it has plateaued. That's a common thing that people expect you to check and make sure their protein is not sort of drifting visibly in which case you have to run it longer and longer because you have not reached a stable equilibrium. Stable. You can look at RMSD of individual amino acids. I think that's one exercise that you do. And then map these into or add them into a PDB and read them into BMD. And then color the system based on their RMSD. That way you can see that the core of the protein, blue guys, are sort of very stable, they are not moving a lot, but the loops and the ends are moving more. That's an easy way to quickly see what part of the system is moving more in your simulation system. Yeah? Yeah, question. For proteins, is again, I mean, I, that's the part that you uh, analyze. So, what is the question? It all depends on what it is. So RMSD is a, is a commonly used, the most commonly used property because you want to show people that uh, for my production phase, so I'm usually going to exclude this part because this is evolving, so I'm going to start from here, for example. For my production phase, the system is not changing. I'm looking at one state, so to say. Uh, RMSD is the only one, so but again depends. I, if you are interested, let's say I'm using a channel, and uh, it takes the channel, let's say 10 nanosecond to get fully hydro to get fully hydrated. So then I look at the number of water molecules inside the core of the channel, and see when it reaches plateau. For example, I'm looking at uh, ion concentration in a particular part of the protein. Then I have to look at average ion. Uh, uh, how to say, residence around that region and make sure that it has plateaued. Depends. It depends on what you want to 
study. But I think for protein simulation, RMSD is really the most common one. In a way, it's boring. Nowadays, we just put it in the supplementary material just to show the reviewers that, yes, I have done. It's not moving, it's stable, but it doesn't have much information. If, if there is a large conformational change happening, you want to show that it moves from one state to another, and then you describe it later, yes, you put it in the main part of the paper. But otherwise, it's a just check to make sure things are fine. And as a, an example, in here, this could be interesting to look at the individual residue to see what part of the system is moving, and then zoom in and see what kind of movement is happening here. Is it correlated with something else? Maybe this motion happens every time there's an ion here. This is going to flip in. You can go in and find um, interesting regions where things are happening. So that's the first kind of pass quickly looking at what is happening in the, in the protein system. But then putting them in the biological context is a, a so as I pointed out, you can look at the individual residues and plot something like this. Usually you see loops with high RMSD and the core. With the less RMSD, I pointed out, you can plot that in BMD. It's one example in which you are looking at the potassium channel. You can clearly see actually the helices are very stable, and there are some loop regions that are showing uh, high fluctuations. So just to describe globally to the general motion. So now, one thing that I mentioned is uh, the time scale issue. And uh, so we have, yeah, we have seven more minutes and we're gonna have a break. So let me start. So time scale is a major bottleneck in MD simulation, especially atomistic MD simulation. And there are two ways of maybe uh, Dealing with that, one is uh, to go to non-equilibrium MD simulation, not to wait. You're waiting for a diffusion to take place. Let's say you're tired, you want me to leave the room, and I'm just fluctuating here randomly, blindly, back and forth, left and right, without really leaving the room, so you can apply a force and bias my motion toward the door, so I leave the door, the room. So that's one way of going on the curriculum system, so adding additional forces, biasing potentials, you can encourage the system into sort of to, to do something that might take much, much longer. The other way to deal with this is to go to reduced representations, and obviously coarse graining is, a, is the most commonly known method here. So, so let's look at some examples <clears throat> here. So now, when we talk about applying a force or a biasing potential, which results in a force on the system. So one method to do this is known as a steered molecular dynamics, or SMD. So it's a very, uh, uh, so you calculate your uh, natural forces from your force field, from your potential energy function. And then on top of that, you're going to add forces to different parts of the molecular system. For example, you can add force to me, just gentle force. If you apply too much force, of course, bad thing is going to happen. And just pull me gently toward in that direction. So if I move on here, so its force is not enough. But maybe as soon as I'm here, I get encouraged to take two steps forward and one step back. And that's going to accelerate my motion in that direction. Then you can sample what happens. You say this is a channel. As the ion goes through the channel, you can see what is happening to the channel? Am I get attracted more in this direction when I'm passing this region? You will start sampling and visiting at least your pathway. If you don't do this, you might actually spend all of your simulation just sampling me in this region because of the high entropy that I have here. So by doing SMD, you, you move from equilibrium. You have to be very careful about how you interpret your results. Some of them might be artificial. like. Let's say if you really pull me very hard, I go over this table, even though it's not the natural pathway and mechanism. So you might have a lot of hysteresis in the system. The system might actually open and close, breathe. Usually the I wait for the breathing motion to go there. But because you are pulling me, I might go into a narrow region artificially. So lots of artificial things can happen. But 
and you have to keep those in mind, but at least you sample, you get some initial guess for whatever else you might be. How much do you think the direction that you steer actually matters? The like direction? As long as you probe it outside of its equilibrium conformation, do you think that's enough to set it in motion? Or if you push one way, is it more likely to maybe behave not naturally? Oh, uh, I'm maybe you're thinking about a specific example. I'm say it again. I so it's sitting in an equilibrium state, right? Okay. And you're waiting for it to behave the way you just behave in general. So if you if you apply a force to kind of push it along its path, does it matter how you apply the force, or it's just kind of jolting it? Does it matter how I apply the force? I think, I mean, I only have one way to apply the force. So you're talking about the magnitude of force or the, the directionality vector. Right. I mean, in this case, the force, the vector is defined by my, from here, I want to go there. So that's my vector. Okay, so that's... that's okay. It depends on the problem. So you can, let's say we have been rotating. So we have a rotary enzyme. So we just apply tangential forces to many atoms to induce a rotation. Mm -hmm. okay. So we, we have had cases in which we wanted to generate hydrostatic pressure across the membrane. So we keep the membrane fixed, otherwise everything moves. And then all the water molecules are pushed gently down. On the top, they generate positive pressure. At the bottom, they generate a negative pressure. You get a gradient. And that encourages water molecules to go from top to the bottom more. Still, you get backward, as you should. But uh, So it depends on the, you can do, use really different magnitudes, different directions okay. for your force to create. Can I just add two yeah. points in here? So for instance, let's say that you want to remove a ligand from your enzyme binding pocket. Of course, the directionality and the magnitude of your force will matter, because if you push too hard, you can deform completely the binding sites. If you put a slow, it might not be enough to actually take it out. Or let's say that, and you will probably hear this from uh, Raphael, who we'll talk about tomorrow, that let's say that you are pulling two systems apart, that you know that they can handle uh, that uh, some kind of force, by experimental atomic force microscopy. You can do this by ser uh, SMB, certain uh, microdynamics, and you actually have to pull in, this, in the axis of the experimental uh, or to match experimental uh, axis, forces axis. Otherwise, you are uh, probably measuring different force propagation path. So all these uh, experiments has to be or matching the experiments or to you have to think about your system and you don't want to disrupt it, disrupt it too much. Otherwise, you are just, you are making God, but not in the right way. You are messing up too much with your system. So that's... It is, it is, uh, it's, it can be very complicated, like the ligand non-binding or even ligand binding example that you mentioned. We have been dealing with this, but let's say it's not a ligand binding like this, it has to come here and go there. So how would you do that? Would you change the direction? You need to know, you need to design it. <clears throat> you need to enforce the mechanism that you want. So that's really, uh, so, okay, so it's, it's powerful. It allows you to sample, to visit, to do things. And then, the, but the system will be driven from the equilibrium, and then you have to be careful. So one, uh, uh, based on second law of thermodynamics, every time you are working on a system, you are putting work into the system, the amount of work that you put, in this case, force times displacement, in my case, it's going to be larger or equal to free energy difference, which is usually the quantity you're interested in, so what is the free energy difference between this state, me here, and that state, me being there, that's really what, what you want to describe. So, but work is usually larger in macroscopic systems, but then when you do this microscopically, uh, interesting things happen. So let's say you go from the initial state to a final state, and the reaction coordinate, the change is described by lambda, position, in this case I'm here or there. And then during this process you have work and heat exchange and we are interested in the delta G between the initial and final states. <clears throat> so if you look at the, if you do this experiment 
experimentally or computationally, if you do this many, many times, if you pull me from here to there several times, then you look at the, how much work it takes me to go from here to there, and you look at the distribution of the work, that's the average work, uh, and the average work is going to be larger than the free energy, okay? Because, again, you are working too hard, and if you wait for me, my thermal fluctuation might actually take me there. So most of your experiments or simulations, you know, the actual value that you get for the work is going to be larger than the free energy change. But there are a few rare simulations, again, or experiments, in which the work that you are doing to the system is going to be smaller than the free energy. And the reason is that, let's say, I'm going there myself much, much faster. You don't. The work that you are applying or the biasing that you're applying, your biasing potential goes from here to there, I'm already ahead. So you're pulling me back, kind of. So that kind of work has a negative effect. So you have rare examples or cases in which the work done to the system is going to be less than the free energy change in a microscopic system because of fluctuations. <clears throat> so now, if you do this, so now instead of looking at the average of work, if you look at the exponential average of work here, then you get a very interesting equality, even though the work is at the average of work is larger than free energy difference. The exponential of work is going to be, the exponential average of work is going to be the free energy, the correct free energy. And this is because this is a negative exponent here, and the small values of W are going to dominate this exponent. So those few rare events are going to actually significantly shift it to the left to match it to the free energy. So this is known as Jarzinski's <coughs> equality or identity, and it has been even proven experimentally. There was a science paper from Bustamante's work in which they pulled DNA many, many times very fast. And if you compare, you get it actually with the right free energy change within half a kilocalorie per mole, which is pretty impressive for a long stretch of DNA. <clears throat> but again, you see, you have to repeat these so many times to sample this little tape. So in a way, you're converting the sampling problem from one form to another. So yes, I can do non-equilibrium system many, 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 many times. And then a few of them are going to be, give me sort of those rare events that I need to get my equality correct. But then if you look at how much time you're spending, maybe it's better to run one simulation in which I put all the time here, allowing me to naturally diffuse from this side to the other side. So there, there is always sampling issue. It's a very elegant formality, formalism. One advantage of doing many simulations over one very long simulation is that many, many simulations can be run on computers at the same time. You can submit 200 jobs to your supercomputer, whereas if you want to run one very long simulation, it might take, I don't know, six months. So this parallel aspect of uh, this kind of simulation setups is one advantage. We see other examples in which we look at multiple replicas so that's, those are, give the, they give you some advantages in terms of sampling, and if you can define them as a thermodynamic ensemble, these are always advantageous because supercomputers love you to run one simulation, I don't know, taking thousands of processors. <clears throat> so this, is, uh, this becomes also advantageous from that perspective. Uh, so we can have a break, uh, but then before that, any questions? Yes. So the, for example, in those pooling experiments, mm -hmm. they have to be done all at the same speed, the, the pooling, in order to get the, or, or, you, uh, or you can have different rates. And different I mean, you can have different rates. I mean, at the end, because what you are averaging here is, uh, is work. But, uh, <clears throat> so there are other considerations. For this formalism, you can do whatever you want. You, you can yeah, so you calculate the work, and then you put it in here to get the free energy change. But uh, in terms of matching uh, 
where exactly the ion is in this case, or what is happening, uh, it, it, it's, it's much easier to set it up in a way that you have similar conditions. So that's, that makes it easier to analyze. But you don't have to use the same. <clears throat> so also there are also the sort of spring constant, the force constant is also important. Like, uh, so in many of these pulling simulation, what you do is not like, uh, what you do, you define a potential, a biasing potential that is moving in a constant velocity. That's, uh, there are two regimes, let me back up. There is a constant force scheme in which you say, I'm going to apply 100 piconewton on this atom, constant in that direction. So there is always a force 100 picosecond, uh, pico newton connected to me. That's constant force pulling or SMD. So we have another regime or a protocol in which we call it constant velocity. The problem with the first one is that you don't know what force you need for me to overcome the barrier. Is it 100 piconewton, 200 piconewton? Am I going to apply it and see what happens? Maybe after 100 nanoseconds, nothing happens. So I'm still here because there is a large barrier here for me. Since you don't know how much force you need, it's better to use a variable force scheme. So you define a potential, and then this potential, this biasing potential is moving at the constant velocity. As long as I'm following, the force doesn't increase. But let's say I get stuck here, and your biasing potential keeps moving. It's like the spring is getting stretched, and you keep increasing the force acting on me until you have enough force for me to overcome the barrier. And then at that point, again, the force comes down. And that's what you want. You want to apply minimum force necessary to induce a process. So now if your force constant, the spring constant, is too weak, then you have to stretch this spring very large before you have enough force build up for me to overcome the barrier. I overcome the barrier in two angstrom. You still have to stretch the spring for 40 angstrom. I keep feeling that large force unnecessarily for a long stretch. So that's why the force constant should be usually Strong also allows the, some of the uh, uh, derivations to be done better, matching, and everything. Because we we use a, we use the time at some point, and again, I mean, you see, you, you have four copies of the simulation. One of them in five nanosecond, I'm here. In the other simulation, in five nanosecond, I'm there. How you would do the averaging becomes complicated. Back. Um, so how do we uh, calculate the, uh, the work done? Uh, because we need the force, right? And we need to integrate that force over the displacement of the atom. Yes. So where do we start integrating and where do we end? Depends. I mean, what are the two points that you would like to calculate the free energy between? So, I mean, for all these free energy calculations, you don't go from here to there all the way. We usually break it into segments. And because, you know, if you calculate free energy from here to here, and then from there to there, you can just stitch them together. Yes, you can just, we try to do it as many, many segments usually. <clears throat> okay, so let's have a break with simulation. Just as an example, so we have been interested in two different channels. One of them we know is conductive to glycerol. One of the other one is only a water channel. They are pretty similar, and uh, so uh, so we did the SMD simulation. Glycerol is usually in, at low concentration; it takes a long time for it to diffuse, even through the channel in which we know it should go, and we know that it should not go through this narrow channel. But again, using this non-equilibrium method, steered MD, we can apply a force in this direction, sort of defined based on the uh, orientation of the pore, and you can have constant force or constant velocity, and then you pull this through in, uh, in a time that you can afford. Usually you can decide about the length of the simulation based on your computational resources, and you slowly pull it. The constant velocity scheme, you can see it actually sort of get stuck somewhere, and then jump another barrier here. You can start seeing features that might suggest what is happening inside the pore, and then you analyze it. You can describe these binding regions and uh, uh, 
And then what I said, uh, and I think somebody was asking, so now uh, you can go back actually to these four trajectories. These are actually pieces in which we are pulling. So we start from this point and pull it in this direction a little bit, pull it in the other direction a little bit in another simulation. There is another two segments. And then we get the free energy for these segments, and then we place them together to get the free energy of the of the entire profile by stitching this together at some statistical analysis. <clears throat> and we come up with a number that is uh, pretty reasonable given the very, very little sampling we have here. It's only four copies. It's uh, almost magic that it's working, but so we get a nice barrier for this free energy profile based on non-equilibrium simulations. So, yeah, let me actually skip this idea. Now, if you do this for a channel in which we know glycerol doesn't go through, we repeat, we simulate, we induce something that doesn't even take place. So, and that's actually a power of simulation. You can do things that cannot be done in nature. Uh, you can play God in your simulation system. I always emphasize this, how many different things you can do to, for example, test your hypothesis and check your hypothesis. You can neutralize a sodium ion. You can even have a negative sodium ion, let's say. You can mutate not only the side chains, you can also mutate the backbone. You can make something 10 times heavier. Very easy by changing a few numbers in your data files. So these are things that you can use to test any hypothesis. At least within the simulation framework, you show that your hypothesis is right. Whether or not it will be verified experimentally, that's a separate issue, but at least within the framework of your simulation and computation, you can actually make your conclusions much more valuable by changing something and show how the effect is uh, <coughs> modified. So now we, we had the red profile was, was for the conducting channel, and now we are inducing the same event through the non-conducting channel and show that there are huge barriers in the, involved in the in the core. Is there like a theoretical or a way to calculate the number of repetitions that you need in principle do to No, I mean you can do things to show things or start to converge. Like okay, so now five copies, I did five copies, here's my profile. The ten copies is a little bit different, the fifteen is more or less the same. You can show that you started to converge, but there is no way to know how many copies I should I should use. <clears throat> People have tried to do uh, some for, again, I mean, it's very much model dependent, but it's a process that you're looking at. You know, for simple things, maybe you can come up with a theoretical model for, but every system, every protein, even proteins from the same family, like this one converges better, this one converges much more slowly because it's a very high barrier. So usually these high barrier regions are the problem because you want to spread it. Unfortunately, no. The more, the better. That's all <laughs> I can tell. Okay, so this is a, a now battling the time scale case too. So now I think that was a very simple reaction coordinate and ion going through the channel. So now let's say now you're dealing with a with a conformational change of a protein. That's not a single reaction coordinate. It could be very complicated. You can define this as a single reaction coordinate like a RMSD. I go from RMSD 0 to RMSD 5 or whatever. But then, as I will show you, then you lose some of the specifics and you don't get the right mechanism. So for this, I'm using a, a transporters as an example. This is one of the projects, one of the signature projects of my lab. We are really interested in describing their motion, important proteins, everything that is transported in your body between compartments uh, is done by these guys, different shapes and forms and flavors, and different energy coupling. And they, in, in, in contrast to channels, channels usually have one gate, they open, and things go down the gradient. Whereas transporters usually generate gradient. They work against electro, they can work against electrochemical gradient, which means they cannot be open to both sides of the membrane at the same time. So they have to close one end before they open the other end, which means there's a lot of protein conformational change 
and this has to be coordinated with what is found inside. And so it's a very interesting but very challenging problem. So you can see I have one example here suggesting already that this is not a simple one reaction coordinate move. You have motions in two perpendicular planes. And so we want to do these things. And yeah, so I think I, I mentioned they, they work based on alternating access mechanism. You have to close one end before you start opening the other end for the substrate and co-transported ions in this case to, to, to pump from one side to the, to the other side. Okay. Yeah, so these are some examples. We are in the, so somehow the substrate binds here and then it changes its acceptability from one side of the membrane to the other side through different conformation of changes. And now experimentally, people have been able to trap maybe the end states. In some cases, we don't even have the two end states. We have only one state conformationally characterized. So it's a very complex, diverse conformational changes depending on the protein. This is the drug exporter we were talking about. This is a neurotransmitter transporter, and this is a sugar transporter. So different mechanisms. So we developed a set of uh, non-equilibrium methods. So they are very slow, millisecond, second, or longer. So they cannot be described using equilibrium simulations. That you do. We have to do non-equilibrium. But the question is, which way you push? What is your reaction coordinate? Are you going to push me here, going from here to, to the other end of the table uh, room? Are you going to push me along this side? Am I going to go along that side? Maybe it's better to go up and come down. What is the pathway along which you want to accelerate the process? What is the mechanism? And that's a huge $6 million question, uh, always difficult to answer. So to simplify, I think many people have been actually looking at RMSD-based transition. So say, I want to go from here to the other end of the room. My RMSD here from there is five angstroms, and I'm going to decrease my RMSD in a time-dependent manner linearly uh, uh, in the time of the simulation that I can afford. In 100 nanoseconds, I'm going to go from RMSD 5 to RMSD 1, which is there. And this RMSD is going to work on the set of atoms that you specify, slowly changing the conformation from here to there. But the problem is that you, you might completely miss stages and steps involved in the mechanism. So one famous example that the group published a few years ago was uh, sort of dominoes. You can imagine if you have dominoes, the first one falls, and then the second one, and then the third one. Whereas if you go RMS, it's possible that they all move at the same time down. So that way you lose. The RMS is changing linearly, but you, it's a completely wrong mechanism. So we, we developed, we, we suggested that actually it's, it makes sense to look at the protein architecture and come up with system-specific reaction coordinates based on the angle of helices and everything. And then your initial guess that you can take and do refinement of free energy calculation is going to be much better. It's like, so here is my energy landscape sort of now a two-dimensional or three-dimensional. And I'm standing here at night. I have no idea about the landscape, how it looks. I know that there is this is one minimum energy point. This is another state. I would like to go from here to there. I can use my compass and say, let's go northwest a little bit, linearly using RMSD, and then try to refine that. For example, I can take points from this initial guess that you use in your targeted MD, we should try to reduce the RMSD, go from one point to the other, and then take out these points and try to relax them locally, and you find the local minimum energy path here. But if your real pathway is too far from this initial guess, there is no way that this bad initial guess can even bring you close to this complex transition. For simple system, TMD works great. We do it all the time. So let's say you have two domain motions. You know it's a sort of shell, clamshell-like kind of motion. It works perfect. You can even work with the distance or 
this is a simple transformation. Of course, perfect, because there is no other way. But for complex transitions, unfortunately, it's, it's not the best way of doing that. So we suggested, OK, so let's spend a lot of time exploring this path by, as I said, let's, let's take me from this side, or maybe from that side, use, trying different pathways and mechanisms. And if you do that, then you have a better chance to, to start to sample at this part of the real transition. You, the, um, there is no way to sample it systematically and completely, the entire space. But at least you can expand your sampling significantly by exploring a little bit more in the initial phase. And so in this form, my potential energy, my biasing potential, force constant, the harmonic way of uh, defining it, uh, my reaction coordinate, uh, which is going to change from an initial state to a final state in a time-dependent manner, depending on how much you can simulate, 1 nanosecond, 10 nanosecond, 100 nanosecond. I can use different reaction coordinates, different variables here. For targeted MD, this variable is RMSD, simple, well-defined in all simulations. But now I can also use radius of gyration, orientation of the pieces and everything. I can use those. These are more system specific. Uh, like in the domino example, I can say first this one falls, then second one, then the third one. The angle of this, the angle of that. And I can change the sequence of these. So I can linearly combine different variables and do this a little bit more. So this is a sort of a little bit more advanced application of these non equilibrium methods in which you are pushing along particular reaction coordinates or collective variables. Very well established and very popular, actually very powerful, and nicely implemented in NAP. So I encourage you to consider that. For so now you have all these initial kind of uh, accelerated MDs. Maybe I shouldn't use accelerated, biased MD simulations in which the system is evolving along a particular reaction coordinate that you define. How are you going to compare these and see which one is better? So for that, we suggested that non-equilibrium work might be a good measure because even though it includes a lot of hysteresis in it, because you're pushing things that happen in a millisecond are happening in a nanosecond now. Even though you're pushing, there is a huge dissipative part to those to the, to the non-equilibrium work, but still it seems that they are sensitive to, to the details of the protocol. So like if you use RMSD-based transition, you end up with a huge amount of work, 600 kilocalories per mole, to induce the transition. It's so difficult for the protein to undergo that kind of conformational change. Whereas if you start changing your protocol, you can bring this down significantly. And these are initial guess, remember. Only 20 nanoseconds per process, that is several milliseconds. Still too fast, but you can significantly reduce the amount of work you have to put into the system to induce the transition. So now this one has a much better chance to find something meaningful, whereas this guy has no chance. In fact, we know for this particular example, if you use RMSD, it's going to give you a wrong mechanism. Here, actually, I have the mechanism here. For the red curve, it goes left and then down, whereas for the black curve, it comes down and then goes to the right. Right down and then down right. And it also visits an intermediate that we know from experiments. So we know that the red curve is wrong for this case. It forms actually a channel, if you look at it. And I just told you, this, these guys cannot be open to both sides of the so the protein architecture has been evolved in a way that doesn't allow formation of a channel. We see it in the non equilibrium work, and we know it also from intermediates. So by doing this, then we can uh, we can see we tried, I, we did uh, I think I don't have we did 200 different initial quick simulations, and then you can start seeing the mechanism. Oh, every time you do alpha bits before beta, it's very high work. When you switch this, every time beta comes before alpha, which, by the way, means you have to close this end before you open this end, matching the mechanism, then things become easy. So 
So anyway, so my short message is, if you have a way to better design a reaction coordinate for the conformational change that you want to do in the system, do that instead of RMSD. RMSD is too coarse and too, uh, too non-specific, too general. And this is, again, you can see the, what we found was, the, in this case, the transition is, uh, uh, involves a lot of stages. You know, you have twisting angle of these guys, separation of this end, separation of this end here. So there are multiple steps involved in the protein conformation. Okay, so... Uh, I am low battery. Can I take borrow? Oh, thank you. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I. <clears throat> Now, one thing that you might uh, you might also talk about this is another transporter in which we look at transition and multiple reactions. Uh, so in this case, we go from inward facing in the absence of the ligand to outward facing, you know, inward facing, outward facing in the absence of the ligand. That's one transition of the kind I just showed you. Then each of these can bind the ligand. So for ligand binding to the apophore is one kind of transformation that you're interested in. Ligand binding to the outward facing is another kind of reaction that you're interested in and want to simulate. And then for the bound core, again, you're interested in looking at the transition between the two. <clears throat> and if, uh, if my uh, the reaction, the protocol, the mechanism, <clears throat> that I'm looking at, is it, if it's correct, then it should be sensitive to the presence of the ligand. So one method that we use to characterize the free energy uh, between these states is umbrella sampling. You will hear more about this on Wednesday. So to make sure that the system samples all the points along the reaction coordinate, you add biasing potentials at each point and make sure that the system stays there and samples that point. And then you stitch them together using the histogram analysis method. So now what we did here is a, is a replica exchange umbrella sampling in which the copies of these umbrellas, and for regular umbrella sampling, they don't see each other. You just have one simulation in this umbrella, another simulation in the next umbrella. They just do it independently, and hopefully you get some overlap between them that allows you to put them together. For replica exchange simulation, which is something that is becoming very popular, again, because it can be submitted to thousands of processors, then you allow these umbrellas to exchange. Initially, the method was defined for uh, temperature, different temperature simulations allowing you to run at a high temperature to sample a little bit more and come back to low temperature. But we are using uh, uh, Hamiltonian replica exchange in which the biasing potential is being swapped. So these kind of simulations allowed us to nicely just cut to the chase, nicely describe the free energy. These are free energy values and profiles for the APO form, as you can see, the transition is not allowed as was proposed experimentally. And for the bound form of the protein, you can see that just presence of a small ligand inside the protein is enough to bring down the free energy barrier significantly to make the transition allowed. So that is really <coughs> nice uh, to really capture nicely what was experimentally proposed, and this is this is just a cartoon. This is just a hand-drawn uh, uh, graph. It doesn't have any value associated. If 
body can capture nicely how chemistry, in this case, details in the binding pocket is coupled to protein conformation. So, Ryan, how much have we alloc allocated for you? Uh, the program took 20 minutes, but I can. I'm flexible. <laughs> and well, you are? Originally, I was supposed to talk at 1140. 1140, okay, so I still have. Okay, good. So. Yeah, so that's uh, just another example of this non-equilibrium kind of calculations, allowing you, here we are looking at the elevator type transporter system in which the substrate binds here and then comes down and is exposed to the other side of the membrane. So this kind of motion, we are describing this motion as you're breaking it into two system specific degrees of freedom, a translocation, and the change of the angle. And what we don't know which one happens first. So is it rotating and then coming down, or is it coming down and then rotating? So we define a two-dimensional space for the translation and rotation, and then explore the entire space <clears throat> to find out the, the actual mechanism for this transition. So you can design these art, these become expensive for various very large systems. But for a smaller problems, you can define one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. Three dimensional would be already to pay uh, uh, simulations and nicely get the free energy profile. So here is another case in which we are using computational tricks to uh, look at processes that are not easy to simulate. In this case, actually, we don't have even a nice reaction coordinate to to allow this uh, to take place. But again, using the simulations, you can induce processes like fusion of the two membrane or formation of a vesicle, vesicle body, using the, uh, some of the techniques that uh, we have here. So make sure I have time to talk about the last part as well. So here you can see, for example, how we are inducing a curvature using uh, some additional potential that we are adding to the system here. These are not uh, <clears throat> simple to define, but if you define them, uh, uh, you can induce any shape transformation that you're interested in. You can make it even fancier, and this computer listen to me. All right, there you go. And if we change our potential in a time-dependent manner, you can see that we can induce the wave motion in the in the simulation. And uh, yeah, so you can actually use again a variety of non-equilibrium methods, uh, sort of very complex force calculations to induce complex processes in your simulations. And then final example I wanted to just point out is, uh, again, coarse graining is the most famous way of reduced representation for biomolecular systems, allowing you to go several microseconds. This is another example in which we're trying to have a reduced uh, representation for our membrane to allow things happening faster. So in this case, we are interested in how proteins and other molecules interact with the surface of the membrane. So for a full membrane model, you have these long tails of lipids that entangle and make the diffusion of these head groups very, very slow. If you are only interested in how proteins interact with the surface of the membrane, we argue that we don't need these long tails in the middle. We can re remove the yellow part of these lipids, keep the first five carbons of each tail, but then remove the rest and fill it with an organic solvent. And then we call it highly mobile membrane mimetic model. Just for you to remember, it's called the mm model. <laughs> and then, bad acronym, but we are stuck with it. <laughs> so then, this allows you, again, it's a reduced membrane representation. It has perfect atomistic description here. We couldn't do coarse screening, by the way, in, in this case, because 
we were interested in the stereochemistry of the lipids on the surface. So increased lipid mobility. This was actually a simulation we did before the HMLN model in which we were interested in how this coagulation protein binds to the surface of the membrane. It doesn't complete the insertion, so we have to do SMD, pulling the center of mass, acting on all the heavy atoms, including the calcium ions that are found here, and just pull it into the membrane. And we were lucky that this went into the membrane. Some of the simulations, you do this, you pull this down, and the membrane curves under the protein it doesn't insert because you're not giving it enough time to for the lipids to open and allow penetration of these hydrophobic residues into the membrane. But then when it worked in some cases, so we got a nice structure paper almost 10 years ago now, and it was the best model for this protein. That was why they liked it very much. But that was a single simulation. We were never happy with the statistics. We had to use 100% of this negative lipid in this simulation to have enough sampling. So we were never happy with the sampling. The reason being that lipids are moving very, very slow. So then we did this HMMM model. So now you can see, if you look at the top view of a membrane in a 10 nanosecond simulation of a conventional membrane, these are individual lipids essentially just moving where they are, whereas in a one nanosecond HMMM simulation, 10 times shorter, you already see mixing, which, which is what you want in simulations. And that allows you to have much better sampling of lipid protein interaction. And then that allowed us to just run this membrane binding simulation. Now this time without applying any force, we just put this protein in solution and it just binds and inserts into the membrane in very quickly, in less than 50 nanoseconds, sometimes in less than 10 nanoseconds. So that allowed us to even actually look at 10 copies of the, of the protein and get nice sampling and uh, convergence. Uh, and then we are looking at other processes also using this, uh, using this membrane system. This is, again, another example of <clears throat> how much flexibility you have in terms of designing the simulation system that sort of uh, gives you what you want. So you don't have to always uh, work with natural system. In this case, we had to fill the core with the dichloroethane, which has nothing to do with biology. It's a dry cleaning solvent. Probably kills cells if you add it to, to the cells. But, but that was the best solvent we had because it was a small liquid and hydrophobic enough at the same time. So now we actually are designing some solvents. Dichloroethane is a little bit polar, that's why it stays liquid. So we are designing in silico solvents. They don't exist. We just define a bunch of particles, Van der Waals uh, particles, one or two, and we define the Van der Waals interactions and Leonard Jones parameters for them. We have improved, actually, uh, we have optimized those properties to have it in a liquid form, in silico solvent completely. So, okay, so I'd like to leave the last 10 minutes for questions. And then we can switch to, let me see. Uh, no, before that, actually, one more thing, sorry. One more thing, and that's important. So, I've said that several times. One of the most useful advantages of simulation is that you are God, you can play and do whatever you want, and you should use it. I give you one example of the Nobel Prize winning movie. We observe water going through this channel, and then we analyze the orientation of water molecules. Again, we didn't know, but these proteins were known not to allow protons to be transported. So first thing we looked at, okay, so let's look at the water orientation, see. <coughs> we have a conformation, configuration that is necessary for uh, protons to be translocated, which means you need to have alternate hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen. But then in the middle, you have something like this, and then it, uh, water molecules flip. So they come in like this to the middle, and then turn like this, and then go like that. 
and we were wondering what part of this was already a very cool feature observed. Very nice. Nobody had reported anything like this. So that was already good discovery. Very difficult to prove experimentally back then because you can't see hydrogens in, in X-ray structures. But then in order to make it even better, so let's explain what part of it should be the protein. This is a bipolar configuration of water, which is high energy for isolated water molecules. So there is something in the protein that is forcing this. So let's mutate something. That's what experimentalists do, right? They don't say, OK, I think this residue is important for the function. They mutate it and show the function is gone. And then you believe them. So let's do the same thing computation. So let's find out what is responsible for this bipolar configuration. So we had a couple of suspects, these two half pieces, and a couple of residues in the middle. So we started playing with them. So what we did first was let's turn off electrostatic. It completely neutralized the asparagine, choline, alanine, NPA motif, this, this part. Ah, the profile is affected a little bit, but not much. Let's play with the electrostatic charges of these two helices. We neutralize them, something that you can never do experimentally, but we can neutralize the, the backbone groups. No charge on carbonyls, no charge on NH groups. You might wonder why the helices didn't melt. Actually, they did. Then, but then we had to constrain them using additional constraint, keep them helical, but neutral. You can see that the features are affected. And now if, if you combine these two, neutralizing this and the NPA, now water becomes a polarized, relaxed form. So now with this, we did a series of mutagenesis. This was the wild type behavior. And then I have all these mutants showing what in the protein is responsible. At least within my computation, I'm explaining and I'm proving those are the features that cause water. So this is something that you guys should always keep in mind. With a simple addition, your results become much more uh, believable. And that's the cartoon that we made for you to show water. This is the crystal structure, by the way. You only see the oxygens, of course. Uh, this is a model based on the crystal which matches closely with the crystal structure. This is OK. Questions? And then Ryan can. Yes? How uh, involved do electrons in the system? Do you have to be sensitive to the system? No, 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 no. I said just the oxygen. So this, I don't, unfortunately, I, have, I don't have it. So we see the densities. This is, I, I misspoke. So this is a frame in the simulation that matches nicely to the experimental. So we have densities for oxygens here. So now, uh, we had another. Science paper, I think it was science, yes, in which we reported uh, together with an experimental colleague in Sweden, uh, they had a sub angstrom resolution the structure of these guys. So that was 0.85 angstrom resolution, in which you start seeing sort of a little bit of a hydrogens. And that, so we see some of these uh, features actually, like this asparagine. But uh, no, we didn't see it. Yes? In the protein insertion simulation, you created these in silico uh, solvents to make it actually go. But this does happen naturally. So what endogenous features do you think you're missing in the simulation? So on the surface, everything is perfect. In fact, we did um, this model. We have used it like in I don't know, 12, 13 papers. So everything on the surface is perfect. We did even free energy profiles for insertion of individual amino acids. And if you compare it to atomistic simulation, perfect, exactly. But then when you go into the solvent in the middle, for two reasons, your free energies are messed up by two to three, four kilocalories. One is that uh, you are dealing with the liquid phase. Entropy is high compared to lipids. So free energy of everything is lower. And then Dichloroethane is not completely hydrophobic. If it was completely hydrophobic, it would be gas for a few heavy atoms that you have, like propane, ethane, butane. Okay. So it is a little bit polar. So therefore, polar amino acids are further stabilized in the core. Okay. So everything is fine in the head group and the first five carbons, which is where we have most of these proteins interacting. But then below that, 
it's uh, it's it's not good. So that was why we started doing those on natural in silico solvents, and those improve things to a large degree. But again, it's a liquid, so there is no way. There is a reason nature uses liquid tails. Right. For that. Yeah. yeah. How do you characterize the density of these systems, like the liquid and the? Uh, how do you calculate the density? Yeah. How do you match up the density? Like if you say it's water, you know it's one, but you know how to calculate it to make it perfect. Uh, I mean, for the DCLE itself, we have experimental numbers. We know the density. We we do. We have done simulations first, just pure DCLE, need DCLE to make sure that we have the right density, acceptable error uh, from experiment. Uh, is that what you're asking, or are you asking how am I packing enough DCLE? Because that's a very difficult problem. Both how to make sure? In both the way. Yeah. So packing is a is a difficult thing. So because again, every time you pack to, uh, you have a anisotropic system, let's say you don't have enough DCLE in the middle, so it has to sort of shrink like this. So you bring them together um, so that let me actually see what was exactly the problem. Oh, the lipid density and this thing. So let's say, for example, the liquid surface density, if you if you don't have enough lipids, then they try to shrink. But then that means the size of the solvent outside the membrane and inside the membrane is also shrinking. And it should be allowed to expand in the Z direction, right? And that messes up your thickness. So if you if you if you want to have the right thickness for the membrane, let's say it's 40 angstrom, 4 nanometers. If I want to constrain that now, if you don't, if I don't have enough solvent in the middle, so that cannot be adjusted. So there is this problem every time you have a um, closed system. Let's say you have a vesicle or you have a confined system that doesn't have an exchange fit outside. Then it becomes very difficult to get the density right. So you have to do very careful job packing enough, not too much, not too little. In that enclosed, in that closed compartment. Otherwise, it's going to be. So I can talk to you a little bit later. So. Uh.